hear? I can hear you. I don't know the mic. Yeah, I, yeah, I asked them to bring in batteries for this because you know no one else is paying attention to these sorts of things. And they brought in no wrong sort of batteries. Your fortuition <laughs> network. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the recording may be uh, not the best in terms of light. So I don't stand in one place. You may also be 
interested in? The paleomagnetism. Remember that the, the paleomagnetic record is also something that we can use to tell time as it flip-flops back and forth. And we can correlate those flip-flops to radiometrically datable and biostratigraphically datable spots elsewhere. So when you're out in the field, you want to collect, if you have the right rock sort, the polarity of the rocks. Also, palynology. What's that? That's pollen. Remember when I talked about trace fossils before, one of the, sorry, that's, I haven't talked about that much yet. Index fossils. When I talked about index fossils before, one really useful sort of index fossil is pollen. And indeed, pollen is going to be one of our best trace fossils in the terrestrial realm. And therefore, you want to collect samples of sediment and then prepare out the individual uh, pollen grains, and that can tell you when in biostratigraphy you are. Okay, now this section is actually the follow-up. Someone, someone asked before, because I set this up and then I didn't tell you the, the payoff, about how you protect the big, fragile fossils when you get them from the field. So, now this is just a side question of sound right there. We call it jacketing. Um, small specimens, you can put them in like bubble wrap sometimes and so forth, particularly if they're small, compact sheets. The larger things, how do you protect them coming back in the field? Because you can already see on this arm bone, you know, some chunks have fallen out already after we had exposed it. So how are we going to get it out of the field? Uh, it's a practice that was developed in the 1800s, but it's still done largely the same today, and that's to create a plaster jacket that surrounds it. We want to retain some of the sediment around the bones, because that will help cushion it. But for pragmatic reasons, we want as little sediment around there as possible because you've got to actually haul this stuff out of the field. And so making the volume and the mass, the weight, uh, much less is a good thing. So you find the edges of the specimen you're working with. In this case, it was just an upper arm bone, so we were lucky. We pedestaled around it, so we sort of removed all the sediment around there for several centimeters. And then we cover the surface. You know, often we use some sort of separator like wet toilet paper or wet paper towels or something that's going to adhere to the surface of the bone. Sometimes you might put a layer of foil on it. We're going to do that there, so putting some foil on it as well. And then you get strips of plaster cloth. Uh, maybe you just bring a whole bunch of canvas bags uh, and, and mix up the plaster. You know, cut the bags into strips, mix up the plaster in the field, and, uh, and, and then put the strips on. Uh, it used to be that uh, when, you know, before we had modern style casts when, for broken legs, that we had these uh, sort of field rules of plaster, the pre-plastered strips of, of fabric. Those were useful, but you know, the tendency these days is to not use plaster casts for broken bones, so those are kind of harder to find. But in any case, you then plaster up that top of the thing and let it harden after you smooth it out. And then you undercut the pedestal until it's supported by a very narrow area, and then get ready to flip it over. You can see you put a tarp down and flip it over. And then you pray to whatever gods of paleontology you can think of and turn the thing over. And so now you've exposed the bottom. Hopefully you don't see like this precious skull that you now shatter while doing this. The unlikely, you never know. And then you sort of repeat the process. You take down as much of the sediment as you reasonably can from what was once the underside, and then jack it up that top surface. And put the separator on, put the plaster on. And then, as we are wrapping it up, then you've got to get it back out of the field. Um, and, you know, the normal way is good old fashioned brute force. Um, and you know, it's the reason you've got to have at least some young people on your trip. Um, most of us who are getting older, our backs and joints aren't as good. So then you haul it out. In this case, you have to go over like several, uh, several ridges to get down there and try to get it to wherever the vehicles are, because the vehicles aren't always at the site. Now, I was not on this expedition. Sometimes the specimen is big enough and important enough that you want to keep as much of it together as possible. If I remember correctly, this was a um, a partially articulated, so the bone is still in the original position, of a young individual of a uh, tube-crested duckbill. We'll talk about them later on. 
And they wanted to keep as much of it in the original position as possible, but it made it a really, really big block. And it was too far away to walk to the vehicle, and so they managed to get folks from the US military, contacted them up, see if they could come in and fly it out with a helicopter. So they could fly it over, they didn't fly it all the way, they just flew it out from the field, well, from the quarry to a flatbed truck, put it on a pallet there, you know, winch it up there, and then it could be driven off eventually, you know, from on the roads. They weren't gonna fly it all the way back to the museum. So sometimes um, groups like the military or um, it might be like uh, rangers or something, you know, park rangers. Uh, sometimes maybe private, uh, private commercial companies like to help out. You know, it's good publicity for them to be seeing, you know, doing stuff, helping out people. Sometimes, the case, especially in the case of commercial things, you need, you need to work that. But it's not just the big things. Uh, and it's not just the micro stuff to the super micro stuff of the pollen. There's also the in-between size things. So most sites you work at, there are going to be some small fossils present. And indeed, depending on the sedimentology of the location, it might mostly be small material. The larger material may not have been transported there. So we call those microsites. And it involves you know, looking at small things. So here we see a couple of carnivorous dinosaur teeth, uh, as well as the teeth of various other types of organisms, and little bits of bones, and fish scales, and so forth. And those are informative because they help map out the diversity of life. And there's all sorts of different methods for dealing with microsites, but a common one, one that goes back to the old days, is sort of similar to the, uh, uh, similar to the methods of, of gold panning. That is, if you have a stream or other natural water source nearby, and you've got your um, grids of various size, sieves of various uh, uh, spacing of the grids, you wash through there, section by section, and then pick out the fraction of fossils at each size fraction. So this would be the very largest. And another way of doing this is to take bags of sediment from your site back to the lab, and then repeat that procedure in a lab setting. Um, and as long as you can transport enough of that sediment back, that's fine. And actually, as a, in my postdoc years, I worked for the US Geological Survey, so the um, government organization that is responsible for observing and maintaining our natural resources of various sorts, particularly with regard to the Earth system. And I was actually washing specimens, not for vertebrate fossils, but for micro, microorganisms. And part of the tests I would do in the lab would be to take these samples. What was even from smack down at the North Pole? So someone drilled through Santa's house. Um, where we would wash at different levels of screens, you know, would be different fractions of the sediment, and then looking in a microscope and taking out the fossils and leaving behind the little bits of uh, pebble and so forth. And you can see that here, two different uh, sieve fractions here that people are looking for. And it can be really useful. You can find very small stuff. So, you know, crocodile teeth, uh, bits of amphibian bones, here's a lower jaw of a mammal, and so forth. And these were found at some of the same sites where we were also digging large dinosaurs. Now, excavating trackways is even more challenging because the trackways are a feature of the slabs of rock. So, although some people do actually excavate trackways. In this case, this is in the 1930s, and they're excavating tracks. And these tracks, you can go up to the museum in New York City and see those tracks on display. Uh, nowadays, it's, uh, they had to have you know, big flatbed trucks and so forth to haul them out. Nowadays, it's much more common to leave the tracks at the original site and collect the tracks digitally. We have things like LIDAR and photogrammetry, where we can digitally take all the data of them and then you could virtually examine the sites back in a computer. Although, of course, sometimes you might want to go back to the original to look at it. And so here we see, in modern cases, where people, the way we tend to preserve them now is leave them at the site and take digital and other data uh, about those tracks. Now, I do want to say a few things about field work that aren't the science. Uh, it's fun to, uh, to work out in different parts of the country or indeed different parts of the world. So this is in the little town of Eagle Aka, uh, in southeastern Montana, where dogs drive. I was, I was heat with the dog was in the driver's seat. 
Uh, or, you know, you can find other things. This is actually in Wyoming, and the local fauna, so um, a horned lizard. Or, you know, nice bull snake. You don't have bull snakes like this in our area. Uh, some of the, you know, those are areas where some of the, you know, good old fashioned North American wildlife are still present. It's protected land or relatively protected land. So, you know, pronghorns, last of all, once important lineage of North American hoof cattle. Not everything is something cute and cuddly, I know, although, you know, those of us who are into zoology might still like them. So here's a mama scorpion with a bunch of her little babies on it that she's protecting uh, at one of our big sites. You know, or, you know, okay, much more conventionally cute things like various types of rabbits. Um, and, you know, here's a cute kitty. Who doesn't like cute kitties? Um, so that was uh, not actually, of course, out in the wild, but that was the mascot for the local museum that year. Um, uh, someone's local ranch cat had kittens, and they were old enough to adopt, so the museum uh, took up this little CD. And everyone liked it. So. <laughs> and, you know, many of the places we go to are, it's the country, uh, and farming and ranching is still the major mode of life. So, you know, you get to meet other sorts of wildlife or not so wildlife. And in many of these spots, it's actually working country too. And the main way of life is very often ranching. So, you know, watch out for cows, guys. Uh, don't hit them with your trucks or whatever. Uh, lots of gates that you have to go through to make sure you're not letting people's turds wander off to the wrong spot. And so, you know, you could be working on this. Is working up on a micro site and seeing some folks going by Hurting their cattle through the badlands, which is kind of cool. And there they are going past our field vehicle. <laughs> and you know, it's another aspect that's kind of cool when you work outside uh, is you get to see some spectacular uh, landscapes, sometimes being more spectacular by storms coming. That said, you typically don't want to be out in the wild when a big storm like that hits. Um, on the one hand, you know, if there's lightning and it isn't really dry beforehand, these can spark off a range fires, which are no fun. Um, or, depending on the sort of sediment you're driving around, it can be really bad. There's a sort of volcanic clay that, in terms of our, um, in terms of radiometric dating, we love. So fentanyl, really useful, really helpful for doing radiometric dating. It gets wet. It turns into super slippery, sticky mass. And if you are, if your vehicle is on the wrong side of the storm between you and your campsite, you aren't getting home after the storm comes through, at least not anytime soon. So, and you know, a, many communities around the world embrace the local paleontologists. So again, the town of Ikalaka, southeastern Montana. Uh, paleontology is sort of their, you know, ranching is of course they're still their big business. Uh, and then they also have their heritage, sort of the, the rodeo slash cowboy traditions, and there are, are festivals about that. But probably the third level after that is paleontology, and their local museum uh, has done a lot of outreach, um, and you know, like the visit there to the nice people. It's not the only spot I go to. I used to go a lot, hope to get back to the town of Shell, Wyoming. So here it was. Way back in 1993, you know, a population of 50. This class is larger than the population was then. Um, and it exploded in a population by 2013. So, you know, I guess not much to do about there. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I don't know what it is currently, but you know, maybe they've gotten over 90. I don't know. So, um, yeah, just, you know, really, really great food that's really not good for you too much, but you know. Yeah, this, is, this is pitchfork fondue. So there's, there's, there's a lot, these are pitchforks used only for this purpose. And then they're going to skewer this meat and then stick it in these huge kettles of, of boiling oil. And it tastes so good and it is so unhealthy. Uh, but it's fun. And they actually they do this in part as a sort of a gathering with the paleontologists from the field uh, who are in the region and invite us to come out and have a party. And, and the flip side, you know. We want to provide them with something. So it's pretty common now that if you're at a, uh, a region that has the appropriate spot, that you give presentations uh, to a local community, explain what you're doing there, something about your research. And in some places, they've been formalized as outreach projects. So this was the, the spark several years ago for what's now a big event that the town of Ivalaka has. 
every year. And you know, build. All right, but let's get back to the fossils. So you got the fossils on the field vehicles and the transport vehicles. You transported them back to the lab. What do you do with them? Well, the first thing you want to do is preparation, or preparation, because I misspelled it, preparation. Um, so preparation. That is, the specimens are typically still in sediment. And even the ones that aren't in sediment might have had some damage during transport. So you want to repair them if they're damaged, and to remove the sediment uh, so you can get to the fossils as much as possible. Now, in some cases, uh, you might want to leave some of the sediment on there, especially in this day and age when we have CT scans and so forth. We can access the interior in ways that are more effective than just removing the grains of sand and so forth. But removing the grains of sand is still important. So here we have a comparator who's slowly but surely removing some of the sandstone from around a spectacular T-Rex specimen to uh, the Burke Museum in uh, Seattle. And technology is pretty much and, 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 and techniques pretty much similar to what it was you know, in the mid of the 20th century. Uh, there's been improvements, of course, in terms of uh, health and safety and uh, some of the types of the particular tools we use. Uh, but the general principle is the same. Or even the early 20th century. So here it is in like the 1920s or 30s at the American Museum in New York. Now, as I said, uh, sometimes the technology has improved. This is the world's best fossil preparation lab. This is at the Royal Terrell Museum, which is in the town of Drumheller, Alberta, where they basically they built the museum where the bones are. Uh, and um, all this uh, set of different types of equipment, these big humpers with the, uh, these big tubes on them, are actually to remove the particles of sediment that they're scraping away or using air scribes, so they're using little pellets to blow them away. And it's just to make sure that the, the technicians aren't breathing in too much of that dust. That's, you know, that's, that's not good. Uh, and health and safety are important. So, um, and I should point out, preparators, the people who do this, are, are they're scientific technicians. They are the part of the great lab workers that are needed for science to get done. Uh, many of them have some sort of technical degree. Uh, some, though, are trained basically through apprenticeship. Uh, they do original research. They do help to publish. They do publish papers and come up with original hypotheses. Darren Zanke here, very famous paleontologist, uh, but his primary job is as a technician. So, um, and without them, uh, we wouldn't know very much about the fossils. We'd still be in the rocks. I actually did a stint a couple summers at the Smithsonian learning preparation of it, but I wouldn't call myself a preparator. Now, one big aspect of preparation these days, in terms of museums, is people regard this as sort of an interesting exhibit in and of itself. And so most museums set up some sort of windows onto the preparation lab where the people who are visiting the museum can come by and see the fossil being done. And when you do the Smithsonian project, one of the first sets of questions has, is about you guys looking in in the fossil lab and seeing them preparing the fossils. So here's that wonderful T-Rex specimen of the bird. All right. And here it is where, you know, you can see the original jacket of the small horned dinosaur, and they've removed most of the sediment now. So you can get a sense of how big the amount of sediment was around it. And then when we're done, they don't get rushed out onto display. The vast majority of specimens in any museum, it's true of art museums too, do not go on display. They go into the collections where they get studied. But before you actually they can get studied, they have to be curated. So they are cataloged and accessioned that is given formal numbers and descriptions and found you know, a particular spot that's found for them, you know, put into cases that will help protect them. So here's some of my beloved tyrannosaurs uh, in a collection. You know, sometimes oddly shaped bones might be, uh, have to be put in some other sort of uh, location, like these horned dinosaurs. And sometimes there might be jackets that haven't been prepared yet, but they've got to be accessioned away. Uh, someone will get to them eventually. There are actually jackets that were collected during the Great Bone Wars of the late 1800s that have not been prepared yet, which is sort of cool. 
uh, in that, uh, you know, who knows what Hilton Marsh found, or rather their, their field guys found. And then because of that, if you've got them in these collections, a researcher like me can come along and study them at a later occasion and do whatever measurements we want to do and so forth. And so here are, by the way, this is um, the original specimen of Hadrosaurus, the first duck bill found, the one that was found out in New Jersey. And this is the primitive Tyrannosaur Tryptosaurus, also from New Jersey. And these are in the collections in Philadelphia. But eventually, a fraction of the fossils are going to get onto display. Because that is, of course, a big function of a museum, is, is to put things on display for the public to see them. And so this was, they had, weren't putting it on display yet, but they were using one of the exhibit halls at the American Museum in New York to sort stuff out and then get decide which ones are going to be put on display and then get the rest of them back into the collections. Uh, oh, this is actually a little further. So doing research on them. So here's some bones of a tyrannosaur, a young tyrannosaur I was measuring. And you'll know, get behind the scenes and talk with your colleagues about it and argue and so forth. Um, we do work. I just emphasize we do work. Now, a fraction of the specimens that we actually put on display will be mounted. And they all will be mounted to something, which means you will fix it somehow to a, a, a case or a, a floor or something so people can see it. But I think many people really want to see the skeletons restored to the way they were in life. Well, except, of course, without all the flesh and guts on them. Um, so a mounted skeleton. Now, unfortunately, skeletons don't come with all the labels on them to put them together. And more importantly, they are rarely 100% complete. And so you've got to fill in the gaps. And people have gotten better and better with that over time. So here was the original Hadrosaurus specimen mounted. And in many cases, people don't mount necessarily the original bones, but they'll take copies, plaster or now plastic copies of the bones, casts, and mount those. But sometimes people want the, the, pop, the general population wants to see the original material. That's understandable. This was later on in the 1800s with uh, a complete iguanodon being mounted. And so you know, that is what most people think of, I think, when we consider what is a museum. It's a natural history museum. It's a place you go to see mountain skeletons. This is what the Smithsonian's old hall looked like when it first opened, or this when the paleo section first opened. You'll be seeing some of those same specimens. This is the way it was in the, I think they took this in in the 50s, uh, when my family moved to the DC area in 75. I got to see it like this for like a couple of years, but then they shut it down for the last, the previous major renovation, which opened in 1980. And then uh, about six years ago or so, they closed all the paleo halls down again, totally redid them. So when you go to see them, you'll see the new version. But it'll be many of the same specimens. Now, as I mentioned, very few fossils are complete, so you need to fill in the gaps. And so in this case, the gaps have been filled in and clearly indicated as such. The old tradition was to try to hide as much as possible what was not real, not because of duplicity, but because they thought that's what the audience wanted to see. They wanted it to look consistent. But some museums, in this case the Museum of the Rockies, wants to be far more clear what is original versus what is a copy. And so they left the copy material, which are based on other specimens. Sometimes you're lucky and you do a right-left mirror image of the same individual. But sometimes you have to base it off of a different individual. And they left it so that the color, the original chocolate colored bones are the way they are, are there. And then in uh, light plastic is the stuff that fills in the gaps. And so yeah, museums a wonderful place. The old original out of the first specimen of Tyrannosaurus rex. In fact, originally they wanted to mount the first two discovered T-Rex specimens as if they were fighting. Uh, and unfortunately, so this is a scale model. So these models are just you know about a foot and a half tall. Uh, they, they mocked it up, but the technology of the early 1900s really wasn't up to this. They were afraid that the bones were all going to come crashing down and so forth. So uh, they weren't able to uh, to do that originally. But now you know, <laughs> showing up adds life, a little life to the old place, don't you think? 
Um, now, um, nowadays, we can actually do far more dynamic maps. And sometimes, you know, a museum in Spain decided that they would do something other than fighting in terms of their dynamic pose of a couple of T Rex. So, um, and different museums will have different philosophies behind the exhibits. These are some of the original sketches for the new Paleo Hall at the Smithsonian. And that's a photo I had in, during the opening week. And you will get to see it later this semester. OK. So now, moving on to the next topic, which is actually a couple of topics. We're going to shift from sort of the geological end of paleo to the bio end, the biological end of paleo. And with the general theme of being systems and energy. So the living world, plate tectonics, and ecology. So the Earth's systems, you know, weather and climate, biology, hydrology, and so forth. In order for there to be a system, you need an energy source coming in to, or at least one energy source coming in. And the Earth has three major energy sources. For the surface, the dominant one is solar energy. The Earth gets heated by the sun. It gets heated at different amounts, at different latitudes, at different times of the year. Um, the ultimate source of that solar energy is fusion and the sun's core, but you know, it's 100, 150 uh, million kilometers away. So, um, And that provides the energy source for weather and climate. It also provides the energy source for ocean currents, in part. Gravity is the other part of that. And of course, it provides the energy source for the living world. Then, from underneath our feet, through radioactive decay of the naturally occurring radioactive elements in Earth's interior, and a little bit of the heat as it, as, as it, it cools down, as it crystallizes out, it releases some heat as well. That provides geothermal energy. So the energy behind tectonics and volcanism. And it's worth noting that gravitation is an important part too. Gravity helps run streams. That's the reason they go downhill. They, they run avalanches. It helps control the flow of air in air currents and water in ocean currents. So solar energy, geothermal energy, gravitational energy. And with regard to that geothermal energy, one of the big aspects of it, sort of the big scale manifestation, is what we call plate tectonics. Now, if this were GL100 or GL102 uh, or 120, we go into a lot more detail about plate time, tectonics. We're going to do this super simple. The Earth's surface is made up of very, very thin sheets of rock, thin sheets on the scale of the planet. Between, well, on the order of, in terms of the crustal material, it's about five kilometers thick in the ocean and up to about 50 kilometers thick on the continents. Now, it's basically five kilometers, you can walk pretty easy, 50 kilometers. Uh, you can drive in, well, depending on the traffic, you know, really quickly, or really slowly, depending on if it's rush hour or not. Um, and the crust itself is not the whole of these flat slabs or plates. It's actually this crispy crust on the outside, and then a more rigid but bendable material below that. And together, they make up these plates. The energy that's controlling their motion derives from the heat of the Earth's core. And from the Earth's core, especially the, the core, what we call the core mantle boundary, um, you get these convection cells. Very, very super briefly. So we've got the crust is the crispy outside. The mantle by volume is the greatest part of the Earth. It's rock. It's not liquid. It's rock. But it's under enough heat and pressure that it moves slowly, like about the rate fingernails grow. Then way beneath that is the extremely hot core. The outer part of the core is liquid metal, mostly iron and nickel, from what we can infer. The interior is even hotter, but because it's under such pressure, it's not liquid. It's a, it's a crystalline metal core. So the heat coming off the core makes the mantle form these great convection cells. Like if you had a pot of boiling water, the heat from below, it's cool on the outside, you get these convection cells. 
And the motion of the crusts, the motion of the crust, the thin oceanic crust, thick continental crust, is simply a reflection of these conduction cells. It is a side effect. All super, all superficial geology is a side effect of the really, of the main thing that's going on, which is the hot stuff rising, dumping its heat, and then plunging back down because it's cold. Now, these slabs that we call lithosphere, so lithosphere is the crust, the crispy crust, and the bendable mantle underneath, the upper layers of the mantle. They move around relative to each other, and they might slip by each other, like at the San Andreas Fault. Or they can be pulled apart, and new material is generated in the middle as new material cools out. Or they can get crushed underneath each other, with the thinner or cooler material getting plunged down into the interior, and what's called a subduction zone. So mantle conduction cells drives the plates. And taking a look at these boundaries, divergent boundaries where the plates are coming across, that's where we're generating new material. A typical place to find this would be in the oceans. The mid-ocean ridges are these long, 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 long extensions of volcanoes under the sea. And this is where the convection cells are coming together, pulling the heat up. It heats the rock above, they pull apart, and new material pools there. Incidentally, because you're getting new material pooling, it's recording the magnetic age and the radiometric age at the point it cools. And so the oceanic crust is a great continuous record of ages. And then after that, marine fossils will accumulate on it as plankton rains down. Now, sometimes you get divergent boundaries on the continents. For instance, right now, throughout eastern Africa, the eastern part of Africa is rifting away, it's pulling away from the rest of Africa and will eventually be a new ocean basin. Oh, this is showing the oceanic crust recording the magnetic field at the time that it pulls. So we can actually record the history of the magnetic field from the oceanic crust. And we can do it with radiometric data as well. But a lot of the action goes on at convergent boundaries, where plates come together. As they come together, the thinner plates, which are typically the oceanic ones, get pushed underneath the continents. And in so doing, they generate a lot of earthquakes, we feel, and a lot of volcanoes as that material melts on the way down. And the molten material comes up and either chills at depth to form plutons or erupts to form volcanoes. And also you get a lot of crumpling, crumpling on the edge of the continents. We call that crumpling mountains or rather mountain building, and the crumpled rock we call mountains. And sometimes the ocean gets sucked up between two continents until two continents slam together. But because continents are light and fluffy, they're only as dense as granite, they can just build up. They don't really build down too much. And then eventually that area slows down in terms of activity. For instance, when India slammed into southern um, Southern Asia, we got the Himalaya Plateau and uh, well, the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayan Mountains forming. And so here we see oceanic material going underneath the continent, and you're getting both plutonic and volcanic igneous rocks forming. Because this area is getting compressed and heated, you're also getting metamorphism. And as I talked about last week, because we've got old rock that's been pushed up, it's getting weathered, transported, and deposited. And so you're getting sedimentary action. So really, it's where we have these plate boundaries, these convergent plate boundaries, that we have our best new rocks forming overall in terms of the continental situation. Because all major sorts of rocks are getting formed here. But a consequence of these plates moving around is that the surface of the Earth has changed over time. And one of the first big discoveries about this is that the shape of the continents were different in the past. 
And there was evidence from fossils, fossils of land or near marine, land animals, land plants, or near marine animals and plants that were found across what are now the great ocean basins of the world, across the Atlantic or across the Pacific. And by looking at their distribution and the distribution of rocks from the same time period, it turned out that at the end of the Paleozoic era, all these southern continents were in contact with each other. And indeed, discoveries since those, that was about 100 years ago, people first really recognized that, discoveries over the last 100 years have helped piece together the motion of the continents. Now, it's important to remember the continents are not swimming over the ocean. The oceanic crust itself is moving too. So the oceanic crust, new material at the ridges, old material getting sunk underneath the continents. So at the end of the age of dinosaurs, the continents are relatively recognizable, but we see connections we don't have anymore. North America, Greenland, and Europe are closer together than they are now. India isn't contacting Asia yet. You roll the picture back to earlier in the Cretaceous, and you saw that the continents were closer to each other. But due to various factors, including the activity of the mid-ocean ridges, sea level was higher. You roll back earlier, and earlier, and earlier, and eventually you see that the Atlantic disappears. Indeed, the Atlantic itself, this is the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, is one of these rift zones, sort of like what's going on in Africa today, that tore apart what was once a single world continent. By the way, that single world continent did not exist from time immemorial to then. It had only assembled about 50 million years before this, and was itself several other continents stuck together, that, though, which itself came from an earlier supercontinent which had broken apart. And it was the cycles all the way back, or starting back something before the dinosaurs and now focusing on North America. So at that time, we could have walked if we were there from North America to Europe and Greenland to Africa, and maybe have a little boat that could go over to South America. Versus, say, maybe five million years ago, when we could have taken a boat from the Gulf Coast, sailed over Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, the Prairie Provinces, all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, and never touch land. And that difference in sea level, in part, is because whether or not the mid-ocean ridges are slowly moving, as they are today, or highly active, and then the water that they displace gets pushed up onto the continents. And we'll see both phases in the history of the dinosaurs. Time when the activity was low and time when the activity was high. Well, that has to do with the activity with regard to geology. But there's a realm, a science, a discipline that covers the interaction between the non-living world and the living world, and that's ecology. Most people think about ecology, uh, if they think about it at all, as save the whales or something. You know, <laughs> environmental activism. That's not ecology at all. Ecology is a scientific discipline. It is the study of the relations and interactions of organisms to each other, and their natural environment. Now, one would hope that environmental activism would be informed by ecology, but it's not the same thing. And if people would talk about ecology, we could talk about things like autocology, the ecology of an individual species, versus sin ecology, the ecology of communities of organisms. And what do I mean by that? Autocology, we could talk about, say, the autocology of Panthera leo the lion, which ranges from southern Africa all the way up. It used to inhabit southern Europe. There are still populations of it in uh, Central Asia, so the Mideast, uh, Iran, and India. Other are a lot rarer than they used to be. And of course, it's one species, so we can talk about its, its ontology, its role in the ecosystem. or we can talk about sin ecology. I think about the sin, sin ecology of the Serengeti. So we go to the Serengeti Plains, of which you know, the lion will be a member of that community. And within 
that community are different roles. Oh, nice mention, that paleoecology is simply the study of these for possible organisms. One of the most important aspects about the system is how the energy is getting distributed. Um, so different organisms have different roles in a community. To collectively they form ecosystems. The organisms and their non-living environments interacting in a particular region, and from the point of view of paleontologists, I have to add, at a particular time. Because the ecosystems of Eastern North America at the present are extremely different than the way they were 100 million years ago. To many of the ecologists in this building, they don't care about that later part to any real degree. It's outside their sphere. But from my point of view, and from yours, we have to think about that. So a few of the basics here. And that is the energy in the system. The driving energy for ecosystems, the way we have fuel in the living world, is ultimately photosynthesis. Sunlight is taken up by plants as an energy source. Well, not just sunlight itself. Sunlight, and this is the equation, let's make it simpler. Sunlight and carbon dioxide are combined, combined oh, and water, are combined inside the cells of plants via photosynthesis to generate new plant tissue and their waste product, which is oxygen. All the other organisms run the equation the other direction. We call it heterotrophy. We eat other things. We don't eat sunlight and air. So we eat other organisms, and we bring in oxygen in order to do that. And we get, as a byproduct, the energy for our system and our waste products, which are carbon dioxide and water. Now, if you notice, it's just the same thing with the arrow turned around. And so there's an important relationship there. Their plants are using our waste products, and we're using their bodies. Or if we own the plants directly, we eat other things that are made of plants, i.e. other animals. And hence, eating is very important. That's the way the energy gets distributed. And so we call this, this, this aspect is called trophic relationships. Who eats who? We might think about it as a food chain. And this food chain doesn't even start at the beginning here. You know, there will be light feeding, um, photosynthesizing organisms, algae in the water, which are eaten by microorganisms, which are picked up by little crustaceans, which are eaten by small fish by bigger fish, by bigger fish, and then nospray comes around. But really, since most things are, eat and, and are eaten by more than one thing, we have a food web rather than just a food chain. So trophic interaction is very important in ecology. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the shark coming up and eating these people. So the roles of organisms in an ecosystem Producers, the ones that collect the sunlight, plants on land, algae in the sea, or in water. Consumers are the things that are photosynthesizing. They're eating other stuff. The first order consumers are the herbivores, the plant eaters, or the algae eaters. And then at each step above this is some form of carnivore, something eating something else. And typically, you might have an apex Predator. That is an organism in the community, one or more species, that eats the lower order consumers, but is not typically eaten by anything else other than members of its own species. And lest we forget about them, they're also decomposers, things that take the dead bodies, break them down, and as a consequence of that, we distribute that material back into the ecosystem. So producers, consumers, decomposers. So let's finish up with this issue with energy pyramids. So the energy coming in to a system is sunlight. And that powers the plants. But some of that energy gets used for the plants to grow themselves. Some of it gets used for them to move. Remember, plants move. They turn and the sky's going up. So that energy gets used up. And only a fraction of that energy becomes their bodies. 
And that is the fuel for the herbivores. They eat the plants. Now, they, part of that fuel is used for them to go do stuff, to live, to breathe, to go around. But a fraction of it is stored as tissue in their body, which is the food for the organisms further up the food chain. So consequently, the fraction of ecosystem that's higher up at higher trophic levels is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller simply because the energy isn't there. So, you know, comic books or science fiction movies that show everything being a predator, that's not the way nature can work. They're losing energy for that. Herbivores are always going to be more common. Plants always have to be more common than the herbivores. So when we come back, uh, we will start a new look, a different look at biology, and that's going to be the bodies of organisms as we talk about the basics of anatomy.